We welcome everyone to this webinar sponsored by the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. The U.S.-Ukraine Business Council is headquartered in Washington, D.C. This is our 55th webinar since the COVID uh, uh, crisis hit, uh, bringing to you at the top spokesmen and leaders about Ukraine on Ukraine subjects. Uh, the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council was started in 19... 95 in Washington, D.C., uh, to uh, help promote Ukraine as a place to do business, to help it make a better place to do business. My name is Morgan Williams. I serve as president and chief executive officer of the U.S. Ukraine Business Council. We now have over 200 members, which makes us the largest private business council anywhere in the world that's not headquartered inside Ukraine. During this whole horrible moment, we uh, bring you a very important uh, webinar about Ukraine under attack. We're very pleased to have uh, a very distinguished speaker with a long history of being involved in Ukraine and two uh, of our responders, longtime friends of ours that we've worked with. As you know, Kurt Volker was a distinguished fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis Now, former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, former U.S. Special Representative for Ukraine. I met Steve Nix about 25 years ago. He went to work for the International Republican Institute in 2000. He's a lawyer. He's an expert in judicial reform, legal reform, democratic party development, and has worked tirelessly for Ukraine. Mikola Stetsenko uh, is a lawyer graduated from Georgetown, a leading lawyer in Ukraine with one of the leading law firms of Ukraine, Avellum. He started Avellum in 2009. So Kurt, Steve, and Mikola, thank you very much uh, for being with us on this very important occasion. So now, once again, we're very pleased to have Kurt Volker with us. Kurt, Kurt we're gonna turn it over to you for your comments about Ukraine under attack. Okay. Morgan, thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this. It's great to be here with Steve and Nicola as well. Um, it is a horrific, horrific time. You can't exaggerate how bad this is. Uh, I'll go through some of the facts, even though I'm sure everyone who's tuned in here uh, is following this closely, but um, Russia uh, is laying siege to major Ukrainian cities uh, as we speak. Um, they invaded Ukraine unprovoked on February 24th. It did not go very well for the Russians. The Ukrainians have extraordinarily high morale and commitment to defend themselves. They have better equipment, um, better training uh, than they had in 2014. Uh, they have also enlisted the civilian population to resist Russian aggression, which I think is quite remarkable. Um, the Russians, after about three days of incursions, uh, fell back a little bit to regroup. They've spent the last two days now reorganizing themselves, bringing in additional logistical supplies, fuel, um, food for the troops. Um, they have an extraordinary capability still yet to use. Um, the Russians, uh, by any evidence, are unhappy with how the war has gone for them thus far. They've, they've lost over 6,000 troops, probably closer to eight or nine. Uh, they've lost uh, over 20 aircraft, uh, helicopters, uh, tanks, armored fighting vehicles, you name it. The Ukrainians have taken out quite a bit. And the Russians have still not managed to take any major city in Ukraine, although they are working on that. As a result of that, the Russian tactics are shifting a little bit. Uh, they are moving now towards a bombardment of cities to basically to pummel them, um, to try to break the morale and the spirit of the Ukrainian citizens. They are resorting to uh, weapons that are more indiscriminate in how they kill. Uh, much of what Russia is doing would qualify as a war crime. And indeed, Ukraine has already opened a case against Russia in the International Court of Justice. 
so that's on the, and I should add that Russia has also um, taken advantage of its uh, control of Belarus to launch strikes, including missile strikes and air strikes from Belarusian territory. Uh, this implicates Belarus fully in the war already. And there are reports, which of course the Belarusians are denying, but uh, I think they are credible reports that Belarusian troops are now uh, mobilized and active in the fight, uh, at a minimum uh, holding the rear while the Russian forces advance, and possibly also going into Ukraine as well. Um, on the Ukrainian side, as I said, they are fighting uh, with everything they've got. Uh, it is very, very difficult. Um, the Russians can bring in reinforcements. The Russians can rotate the forces on the front. The Ukrainians are there. Uh, they have nowhere else to go. They have one force and they are fighting with everything they have. Um, thank God that in 2017, we lifted the ban on lethal defensive arms to Ukraine and started shipping javelins and other equipment to Ukraine and have been doing so for five years. Even with that, their level of equipment and armaments is insufficient. Um, Russia's attack has prompted increases in security assistance uh, to be delivered to Ukraine uh, from some remarkable sources. Uh, the Swedes uh, have weighed in to provide anti-tank uh, weapons. The Germans have completely changed their security policy orientation here to support Ukraine, to provide weapons to Ukraine, RPGs, um, and to oppose Russia's invasion here. The Belgians are sending assault rifles, which most likely will be distributed to the civilian population so that they can engage in resistance to uh, Russian takeover if it gets that far. Um, the United States has announced in already at the turn of the year, late December, January, an additional 60 million in, in military assistance to Ukraine. That has been increased by a further 350 million, bringing the total dollar value of assistance from the US to a billion dollars this year. Uh, unfortunately, unlike the Swedes or the Germans uh, or the Estonians or the Belgians, the US is incredibly slow in getting our assistance into Ukrainian hands. And it is something that I think needs urgent attention by the White House, by the Pentagon, by the Congress. Um, we have to get stuff on planes and move it quickly. Uh, there is no time to lose here. Ukraine has days to either make it or lose it. Uh, so we have to help them in real time. Um, some of the things uh, that I would recommend on the military side as we come to helping the Ukrainians or, or military or otherwise, they need more uh, Stinger missiles. They need more javelins. They need more basic ammunition. Um, they need uh, support uh, with air defense in whatever way we can do that. I would recommend, and I believe it's a good idea for us to implement a no-fly zone over Kiev and Western Ukraine, together with several other allies in a coalition of the willing. This, this would likely include the UK, uh, Poland, uh, we could see who else, uh, perhaps Turkey, we could see who else would join in that. And this is simply to prevent attacks on the civilian population and attacks on critical facilities such as nuclear reactors and nuclear waste facilities, which would do tremendous damage uh, to the people of Ukraine and to the continent of Europe. Uh, so there's more than enough justification to do this. I understand the worry that this could put US or other countries, uh, air forces, into a direct conflict with Russian fighters or Russian uh, missiles. But I think as we have done in other operations, we declare limited objectives, limited rules of engagement, uh, only to create a no-fly zone, uh, not to attack anyone uh, unless attacked, and uh, not to engage on the ground uh, in any direct fighting. Uh, I think it's doable, and I think it's urgent. Um, there is also a need for greater humanitarian relief to Ukraine. Um, they are running low on foodstuffs, uh, on fuel, and uh, it is important that the international humanitarian aid agencies get in there as quickly as possible. To do all of these things, I would also recommend that the West uh, put in place a secure transportation corridor into Ukraine from Poland. 
There are currently no Russian forces there. It would be uh, a permissive environment, so you're not fighting anybody to establish this. You would need force protection if attacked, but uh, getting a secure transportation corridor in place so that armed supplies and humanitarian supplies could move into Ukraine and be taken over by the Ukrainians is also something I think is essential and urgent. A couple other points um, that I, I want to bring up. Um, uh, I think the economic sanctions that have been put in place over this weekend are finally the sanctions that we were promised. They should have been put in place two months ago when many of us were calling for it and they could have prevented a war. But as it is now, they are punitive um, and they are being felt in Russia. Uh, we are essentially driving Russia out of the international economy and financial institutions. Payments processing for any goods will be virtually impossible. Russia has been shut out of European airspace. Um, they've put a ban on removing uh, hard currency from the country. Uh, people are trying to get cash out of ATMs and they're running dry. Uh, the, price, the ruble exchange rate uh, has crashed. Uh, so the ruble is now worth less than half of what it was just a week ago. Uh, so these economic sanctions that are now in place are finally the ones that we were waiting for and they are having an impact in Russia. They are late and I don't believe that Putin is going to change course because of this. Uh, Putin is um, in a military logic now. His drive is to destroy the Ukrainian state, uh, to kill Zelensky, to put in place a pro-Russian leadership and to occupy the country indefinitely in order to create a new Russian empire as, as we've all talked about in, in this forum before. Um, so Putin has to be stopped. Uh, it's not a question of uh, enough sanctions getting him to change his mind. Uh, he has to be stopped or he has to be removed. And I do think that there are uh, people in the Russian military, Russian intelligence, as well as the Russian public who realize that they are now in the hands of a madman who also has access to nuclear weapons. And this is a terrifying thought. Uh, if you're Russian, if you're Belarusian, if you're Ukrainian, or e if you're anyone else, that uh, he is driving the country to ruin uh, and potentially even using nuclear weapons. Um, the only threat to Russia, I should add here, is Vladimir Putin himself. Uh, no one else is threatening Russia. No one is attacking Russia. The measures being taken against Russia are purely economic, designed to uh, undermine their war effort. All Russia has to do is stop, and uh, Putin is not doing it. Um, so that that is, uh, I think, quite quite severe. Um, how does this end? Um, I think that the most likely scenario that I can see is Russia continues to fight, continues to attack, continues to kill Ukrainians, but bogs down because the Ukrainians will not give up. They will fight and defend their country, uh, their, defend their cities. And the sanctions and the global impact on Russia will continue to grow. Uh, at that point, I think the war bogs down. Perhaps people in Russia do act against Putin, perhaps not. And I think the West, we have been, um, we have been doing the right thing, but too slow and only half measures at a time for months and months. And I think as this war grinds on, we'll find that we will be doing things next week that we take off the table this week. This is what happened with sanctions on Nord Stream 2. This is what happened with sanctions on Russia's access to the SWIFT system. And I would bet that we will have direct US and NATO military support to Russia within a few weeks if the war continues as it is, because it will be intolerable for our publics to see the Ukrainian people slaughtered this way. Um, it is a dangerous thing to do. It's a dicey thing to do, but the alternatives may be even worse, allowing Putin to take over a country to brandish nuclear weapons. He will move on to other countries if he succeeds here. And uh, it's, uh, I think it is in our Western interest to see that he has stopped. Um, if that doesn't happen, uh, I think we're going to face much wider and much bigger conflicts in Europe in the future. 
Um, finally, uh, the only thing I can say additionally uh, to all of the points that I've made thus far is the urgency. I, I don't get the feeling, uh, even uh, yesterday I was on Capitol Hill meeting uh, with a number of aides to senators. Uh, I've heard a couple of people on interviews. I've seen the administration's comments. Um, I don't feel the sense of urgency from our leaders that is required here. And so I would urge everyone here, I know everyone has their own networks, everyone has their own influence, everyone has their own contacts, drum up that sense of urgency because we are literally talking about Ukraine needing help and much more of it in a few days, uh, in, you know, in, in these coming days, not next week, uh, not the week after, but literally in these days. Um, so I'm going to pause there. Uh, I'm sure that uh, from Steve and others, we're going to hear some, some insights, particularly from the ground and Steve's team uh, in Ukraine. And uh, I look forward to questions and discussion in the commentary. Thank you very much, Kurt. Uh, the question has always been, uh, almost everyone agrees with you that the re U.S. response has been slow and weak. Most people don't understand that. It's a no-brainer, like you said, that Putin is a madman. He's the essence of evil. He will go down in history as, uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, madmen of history. It's been obvious for a long time and a kind of a no-brainer again. So why do you think that, uh, why do you think it's been such a problem for the U.S. Uh, government, for the White House to move and like you said, it's critical, and, you know, like you and everybody else, we've been pounding away uh, at the Congress and the White House for a long time. It's just shocking, uh, the response. Do you have any idea about, uh, you know, Natalie Jurasko, you know, a, a great uh, Ukrainian-American patriot. She just put out a deal over the weekend that she was embarrassed, totally embarrassed by the U.S. response. Herbs Kramer and Bill Taylor just put out an op-ed. They've been working tirelessly. They said the United States has done, done, not done enough. They could do a lot more. So all the people like you that's been involved, everybody agrees. But why is the United States, I mean, this is a moment in history. Like you said, it's going to have an impact on the whole world. Why? Why? And what can we do more? It's just baffling. Yeah. The, uh, Morgan, um... I agree 100% with you, um, and I can only offer a couple of explanations that I don't think are uh, convincing, but I think they are out there. One of them is a perception that we would provoke worse by doing things. This is a self-censorship or, or a self-restraint, so that if we, the, the belief is that if we did something, we would actually provoke Russia to do something. We have proven time and again that it is the absence of doing things that actually provokes Russia, actually gives them a green light to move on, um, to move ahead. And yet uh, we still go through that reflexive action. There is also the fear of getting engaged in a direct U.S.-Russia conflict because of the possibility of use of nuclear weapons. And uh, while I respect that fear, uh, again, we have to look at, at the way Russia is behaving and what they are doing. We have our own nuclear deterrent. We have to communicate that we will not tolerate any nuclear use whatsoever of any kind against anyone. And Russians will understand that. The Russian military will understand that. It is not our goal, but we also should not be uh, failing to do anything militarily because of this fear. Uh, this is something that our military and our leaders have been trained to manage uh, for decades. And uh, I think that fear, however, is also paralyzing. And then the third reason is our um, senior managers, senior leaders and mid-level managers, um, lack of um, determination to cut through bureaucratic layers to just make things happen. Uh, the military needs a green light to do what it is capable of doing. And we have to get our, uh, our legal advisors and our mid-level managers and our, our, our policy experts 
uh, to just do what they need to do once and fast so that we can get on with the business that needs to be done. But I think bureaucracy literally is a problem now. When the Secretary of State announces $350 billion uh, additional security assistance, why is that not already in the form of Stinger missiles and javelins and ammunition and on planes already today? Uh, what's the delay? There is no excuse. The United States approved uh, uh, a program for missile defense for Taiwan. The total, I think, was uh, 100 million or 100 billion, or I don't know, it was an amazing amount, far more than they've supported Ukraine, again, which was shocking. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is. Um, I want to say something um, about the degree of international support for Ukraine. Uh, I wish it didn't require or it, it didn't depend upon Russia attacking Ukraine um, for that support for Ukraine to emerge and be as vocal and clear and emotional as it is. But uh, I think Ukrainians can take heart that every country in the world with minor, minor exceptions, is standing with Ukraine, supporting Ukraine. They have revised their views of Russia and of Putin. Um, they're sending aid in whatever way they can. Um, and I'm, I'm just encouraged here, I see in the chat, uh, friends of mine from uh, Montenegro, uh, the University of Doña Gorica are here and sending their support uh, for Ukraine. And I know that all over, uh, all over uh, Europe, all over, Asia, all over America, Latin America, people are standing in solidarity with Ukraine. When this, when this dust settles, as it eventually will, uh, I think we need to be moving swiftly to rebuild Ukraine, to restore uh, all the services, uh, all the, um, the economy of Ukraine, and to bring Ukraine into NATO and the European Union as quickly as possible uh, so that this never happens again. Yeah, well, that's the same thing they said after World War II. We're not going to ever let this happen again. And the world is letting it happen. Uh, the uh, final final comment uh, before we go to our, our good panelist, uh, Robert McConnell, one of the leading Americans uh, supporting Ukraine, put out a major announcement yesterday about how much energy, how much fuel we continue to buy from Russia every day, every week every month. It was astounding how much money is going from the United States to Russia to buy fuel. He said, like Natalie Jurasco, this is embarrassing. It needs to stop now. It's just amazing Absolutely. the number of things that the United States is doing, still doing. That's embarrassing and needs to stop now. Uh, what, any comments from you about all this energy we're still buying from Russia? every day, shipping billions of dollars there every year. Yes, absolutely. This has to stop. I, I could not agree more. Uh, yes, it will cause higher prices to U.S. consumers to replace the Russian oil and gas uh, that is currently being consumed in the United States or in Europe. But this is the money that Russia is getting to pay for this military attack on Ukraine. We should not be giving them the money to do this. Uh, it just simply has to stop. And uh, this also brings up a final point uh, that uh, I'll make. I think the private sector has a lot to do here as well. Uh, the sanctions imposed uh, give good reason for, co uh, for companies in the private sector to um, provide um, support for Ukraine in whatever way they are able to do. And I know a lot of the companies here are deeply engaged in Ukraine. But also, if any of the companies here are engaged in Russia, Get out, uh, just stop. Uh, there is, uh, it's going to be painful anyway. There's gonna be problems with payments, problems with uh, transferring finances, um, problems with moving goods. And there is no justification at this stage for continuing any economic relationship with Russia. Uh, BP has decided to offload its 19.5% um, stake in Rosneft. I think that's a good signal. And I think every company that has any engagement with Russia should be following suit. I'm, thank, I'm very glad you brought that up because the private sector does have a lot of uh, to do here. And uh, we uh, just got a note today that the largest law firm in Ukraine, Astros, uh, 
announced that they will no longer ever take Russian clients. We have a lot of businesses that are saying we're pulling out of Russia and we're going to be doing an announcement to all of our members. Uh, and we've been urged by the embassy and by the president of Ukraine to convince companies to stop. Uh, and we also need more support from private companies for humanitarian. And there's a lot that they can do. Uh, do uh, we have had another company that has a lot of uh, um, jamming capacity that just announced they're going to support Ukraine. So the private sector has got to do a lot. And last night, uh, most of your international uh, athletic organizations said no longer will they hold events in Russia. No longer will Russia be invited to any of those events. So it all adds up. Let's again now go to Mikola. Mikola is one of our great patriots and he's in Ukraine right now. So Mikola, a report from you. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Ambassador Volker. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I see we have quite a few participants uh, today. Well, I, I'm in, outside of Kiev, just, just outside of Kiev in my home uh, with my family with elderly people, with my, uh, with my dogs, and uh, we decided to stay. Uh, so far, our area is, is not bombed, uh, but as we started our um, webinar, uh, there, were news, there are news that uh, the Russians uh, hit the Ukrainian TV tower, the Kyiv TV tower, which is from those who have been to Kyiv, is uh, just outside of the city center uh, in the residential area. And uh, the tower seems to be standing still, but it's, uh, it's gonna be very, very difficult. And um, honestly, it's scary. I, I, uh, I remember talking to my people a few weeks ago and telling them that uh, I have been listening to Putin's speeches uh, for many years, but uh, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't come across as a crazy man. And that uh, whatever he would do, that wouldn't be crazy, but this is crazy. This is what is happening. And uh, it's becoming worse by day, as Ambassador Walker said. So um, many of uh, our employees, uh, first of all, our employees are safe, but m many of them actually left uh, Kyiv to the west of Ukraine, to south of Ukraine. And um, we continue operating. Uh, it's amazing that uh, the, and the mobile and internet services are still operational and we are able to uh, be in touch uh, with, with, with ourselves, with, with our friends, with our clients. Obviously, uh, the work is tremendously down. There isn't uh, pretty much any work at all, but uh, it's, it's not about work anymore. It's about survival and, uh, and defending the country. Um, in terms of uh, uh, my question to, to my best of all, I, it, it may sound a bit strange, um, but uh, two sub questions. One is what, what is uh, that the Ukraine should have asked for at this stage, but hasn't asked yet? And the second one is, what is the time frame you think uh, of, of this war? When do you think realistically we will have a, a meaningful progress, uh, meaning that uh, at least the majority of the territory will be safe? Yeah, I don't think anyone can answer the question of timeline. Um, these things have a dynamic of their own. What I would say is that, um, assuming that Ukraine continues to hold out for another week or 10 days, maybe two weeks, I think the pressures inside Russia will grow to a point where something will snap. What that something is, I don't know. Um, but it, it's not possible for Russia to um, suffer the sanctions, to have the information out in Russia that Russian soldiers are trying to kill Ukrainians and being killed in the process, and that they have embarked on a war of aggression against their cousins, their brothers, their neighbors. Um, this will not be understood by people in Russia, and something will snap there. Uh, that's, that's the one thing. In terms of your question about what is Ukraine not asking for that they should ask for, well, um, I can't think of anything that they haven't said that they need. I, I think that particularly important, and I'll, I'll come back to it yet again, is this idea of closing the airspace uh, to uh, Russian aircraft and missiles. Uh, yes, it's dangerous, but uh, it is the one thing that's going to 
do the most to kill Ukrainians and to disadvantage the, the war effort. Uh, if that was done, the no-fly zone was done, it would allow uh, more support to Ukraine uh, to happen on the ground without danger, it would allow the cities to function. Uh, so this is, um, this is critical. And as I said, I am, uh, it would be wonderful to do this over all of Ukraine, but I think realistically, Again, to show uh, a concern for not sparking a direct Russia-U.S. conflict to do so over Kyiv and West. Ambassador, uh, if I may also, uh, you mentioned that uh, at some point in time, uh, the United States uh, should step in in terms of the nuclear threat. And um, uh, basically, if I understood you correctly, cover Ukraine as well. Is that a realistic scenario? Is it a realistic scenario that the United States can say, we will protect not only the NATO, the NATO allies, but also Ukraine as well. Well, I would, I would frame it differently. I, I wouldn't say um, that the U.S. is going to fight to defend Ukraine. President Biden has ruled that out. It would change the dynamic in Russia to one where Russia now feels it's defending itself against NATO. Um, right now, Russia is embarking on a solo, uh, unprovoked military aggression. And that is uh, incomprehensible to the world and incomprehensible to people in Russia. So I think it would be wrong for us to change the dynamics. Of, so making it about a US or NATO conflict uh, by defending Ukraine directly, uh, I see that. On the other hand, I think we can say something about nuclear weapons, that any nuclear use is wholly unacceptable and the US will not tolerate it. Understood. Thank you. Morgan, back to you. Okay. Uh, one of the leading American patriots uh, for Ukraine for years and years and years has been Steve Nix. He's been out there meeting with presidents, meeting with prime ministers, trying to build democracy, uh, trying to, have, to reform the legal system and uh, uh, the, the judicial system. Steve, thank you very much for all your outstanding work for many years. Uh, we're turning the platform over to you. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you very much for including me today. And, and thank you, everyone, for joining a very important session. Uh, Morgan, your membership just heard a very sound, uh, very comprehensive overview from Ambassador Volker with regard to the military situation, uh, the political uh, possibilities. Uh, so. I, I won't repeat anything except to just underline some of the points that the ambassador made. Uh, first and foremost, more can be done militarily. Uh, and just emphasize Ukraine needs more drones, more stingers, more javelins. Uh, right now, Russian air superiority is the key factor here. And if Ukraine can offset that, it can have success. Uh, we have reports that EU countries are supplying older MiG-29s, but effective aircraft, a total of 70 from places like Poland and Slovakia. So that could be a real game changer. Ukraine needs more of that. Uh, along those lines, I just wanna comment on the valor of the Ukrainian armed forces. And first of all, I am not surprised at all at the fight that's being put up and that Ukrainians are showing the world how to fight Russia because I have been to the Eastern Front uh, I've been to the Crimean front, as Ambassador Volker has. I've spent time with these troops. So I've been on cable television contradicting all these so-called experts that said that Ukraine would fall in a day or two to make the point that uh, in meeting these young men, they would stand, they would fight, and they are prepared to give their lives for their country. And that's what we are seeing playing out now. So it's imperative, as Kurt said, that we support these brave people who are fighting for their lives, for their country, and for their democracy against an evil, evil tyrant that has to be deposed. I think our policy now, foreign policy, with regard to the Russian Federation should be regime change. Let's go ahead and say it. We have to get rid of the world. The world has to get rid of Vladimir Putin any way possible, economically, militarily, any way that it can be done. We have to displace this evil tyrant that is threatening a country, Ukraine, and poses a threat to the region. If you think that those Russian troops in Belarus are gonna remain where they are, guess again. Uh, if he's successful in Ukraine, Putin will move those forces westward to threaten Poland, 
uh, Latvia and Lithuania, e NATO countries. So uh, I will just, the military front, Kurt gave you an excellent overview about what the needs are. Uh, on the no-fly zone, I'll just say, if John McCain were still alive, he would be leading the fight for a no-fly zone. He's not with us anymore. So we depend on the other senators, as Kurt said, there's a lack of urgency. If you have contacts on the Hill, please reach out and tell them this is essential to protect the civilian population. People like McCullough, uh, relatives that I have that are in Kiev right now, suffering bombardment. It's essential. Second point after the military is humanitarian. And Kurt touched on this. Uh, there are ways that you all can help the Ukrainian people. Uh, the people who are, are uh, remaining in the country, the people who are trying to leave the country. Uh, these are, are women and young children. Uh, men of military age are not allowed to leave. They are required to stay and fight. But there are ways we can help all of these people. Uh, Morgan has posted on your website an excellent charitable organization called Razum, which means together in Ukrainian, uh, that has been in action since the invasion of Donbass and the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Very reputable organization. You can be assured that your money will get to its intended, intended place. So uh, Razom, R-A-Z-O-M, that's on your website. If you need further directions, Morgan and his staff can provide that to you. Uh, third, uh, media and communication. It's very clear that part of Putin's calculation is to shield his population from any knowledge of what's going on in Ukraine right now. We have reports of Russian soldiers who've been captured who were told that they were going to be going on a training exercise. They have no idea why they've been sent to Ukraine. More importantly, the, Ukraine, the Russian population has no idea what's going on. Uh, my wife has relatives in Russia. We've called them. Uh, they have no idea that this is taking place. In fact, they become angry when we raise the issue and, and accuse us of, of uh, falsifying this and lying. That's the issue. Older Russians who only watch TV, who don't get their news from the internet, don't know that this is happening. So any way that you can communicate with people in Russia about the truth of what is actually taking place, please do that. Please reach out. And then the energy issue that, that, that Morgan brought up, couldn't agree more. Uh, we have to stop any dependence on Russian natural resources. Uh, Vlad Vladimir Karamuza, one of the leading Russian opposition politicians, once told John McCain and me, the best thing you can do to help Russia and, and liberal Democrats and uh, people fighting for freedom is for the United States to produce more oil and more LNG to lessen the world's dependence on Russian energy. And that's exactly what the US needs to be doing. So again, anybody who has influence on the Hill, Talk to your senators and congressmen. We need to up our game on energy production in the United States. This is another way we can stop Vladimir Putin. Uh, I'm really going to end there because I'm more interested in, in what you all have to say, uh, except to, to sum up, uh, uh, I have 27 uh, staff people in Ukraine. Two of them uh, are in the reserve and are at the front. Uh, seven others have joined the uh, local territorial forces. Uh, they are fighting for their country uh, and they need and deserve uh, your support. So thank you, Morgan, for having me today. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Kurt, uh, uh, it was interesting that the U.S. government put our soldiers on the Polish border to help those that are trying to escape from Ukraine. Gracious. Uh, well, that's good, but that's not near enough. Uh, we know a family that left Kiev early Friday morning, no, late, uh, about Thursday noon, they left Kiev to go to Lviv and to Poland. They're still sitting on the border. We thought they were gonna make, uh, we thought they were gonna make uh, going from Ukraine to Poland, an agreement with the Poland go Polish government to make that rather simple and fast, but it's not, it's a, a huge humanitarian disaster. So they've been from Thursday to today, drove to, and they're up on the border sleeping in their car, you know, not very much food. That doesn't sound like a good situation. We got to try get to get a hold of the Ukraine government, the Polish government, the United States government. We got to do more to get let people out of there. Couldn't agree more. 
Couldn't agree more. It's inexcusable. Uh, this is this is red tape again, getting in the way of doing things uh, that are important for people's lives. Um, I've been reading in the chat uh, comments and questions here. Uh, there's one I think is interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up. It's a question from Mark David Miller about whether other members of the CSTO or other former Soviet republics will be sending troops into Ukraine. And uh, my best judgment there is no. Belarus, yes, but not anyone else. Um, but even then, we're finding that there is a, an intimidation factor. Seeing Russia lash out with this military force is intimidating other countries. Uh, Ukraine today withdrew its ambassador from Georgia out of upset over Georgia for refusing to allow Ukrainian volunteers to board a, uh, to board a charter flight from Georgia to Ukraine to come and fight in the war. Um, the, the Georgians are clearly intimidated by the threat of Russian force and are not standing where they should be on this. If I may also, uh, one more comment. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, because... Yeah, I it just, just uh, I keep thinking for the last few days, uh, Ukrainian president uh, announced that uh, we are creating uh, international uh, legion, I think that's how, how he called it, uh, inviting soldiers, uh, both Ukrainian soldiers serving abroad and uh, foreign soldiers who are willing to help Ukraine to come here uh, to Ukraine to fight against Russia. We are getting all sorts of aid from NATO and other countries around the world. Uh, we are getting um, security data and um, from, from NATO countries. I mean, let's be realistic. I think we are in World War Three already because uh, NATO countries, not directly, but indirectly, are involved in this and, and fighting together with Ukrainians and Russia. So I think the more people, more people under, should understand that this is, uh, we, we are hiding behind masks and saying that NATO is not directly involved. And I, just, I totally understand why, why this is so. But in reality, NATO is fully involved in this. And um, if uh, now, either starting from today or tomorrow, uh, Ukrainian pilots are going to fly uh, new planes that the EU is providing from Poland bases to uh, cover Ukrainian sky that is already involving territories of other uh, countries as well to fight Russia. So this is World War III, actually. Yeah. Um, another point uh, that I'll bring up um, is the uh, co continuous supply of energy in Ukraine. And I've heard uh, from uh, friends at DTEC, which is the largest electricity provider there, that uh, they are doing everything to keep the electric power going. This is essential for the residents of Ukraine, um, that the people, people need energy. And also that Ukraine right now is operating in an island mode. They are not connected to the Russian or Belarusian grids at this point. And uh, this is an appeal to the European Union to connect Ukraine and integrate the Ukrainian grid into the European electricity grid immediately. Uh, th this is something that I think was also essential for Ukraine security. Uh, the uh, occurred, and Steve, on the, on the humanitarian assistance, there's a lot, lot of organizations out there that are very good. We're gonna be putting out more lists. The Ukrainian Freedom Fund that raised a, half million dollars after 2014. They're going back in business. The, uh, the, um, the, there's just a whole lot of them and we'll be putting out more information. The transport corridor is, for, is, is, is uh, very important because all these humanitarian groups, they're putting together supplies, but then they've got to, unless they're already in Europe, they've got to get them to Europe, to Poland, then they got to get them to Ukraine. That's not easy and that's not, uh, you know, quick. Uh, so a lot of more has got to be done to help the humanitarian groups from aid, the U.S. government and others to get these, uh, they're raising a lot of money actually, but then how do you make it effective on the ground in Ukraine? Uh, one more question, Kurt, the EU finally broke neutrality, but is there a sense of urgency? They said they were going to buy equipment. Well, fine but that's not simple or easy either. And one other question, Zelensky keeps talking about, we wanna join NATO, we wanna join quickly. We know that uh, 
maybe NATO has been part of the problem. We know for years and years and years and years, NATO wasn't going to let Ukraine in as long as Mr. Putin was around. So even before he invaded, Ukraine wasn't going to get in NATO uh, 2030, 2040, who knows. So that was never an option because NATO wasn't going to vote them in. So I don't know quite why there was such an emphasis on getting in NATO now when they knew that uh, NATO was never going to vote them in. They didn't want to take on Putin even before all this happened. Yeah. Well, I think the handling of the NATO uh, and Ukraine issue uh, was never done right. All the way back to the Bucharest summit, uh, we, we should not have promised membership. We should have given them a membership action plan and work toward eventual membership. And as Russia's threats increased against Ukraine, we should have moved uh, ahead with membership on the basis of uh, anything but occupied territories, Article 5 would apply to uh, occupied territories, no military solution. We only support the peaceful reincorporation. Um, I think that at this stage, um, we're in the midst of this war right now. Uh, nothing's going to happen on, on NATO membership for Ukraine during the war. But in my mind, the logic of not bringing Ukraine into NATO has been destroyed. Um, once the dust settles, and if there is a peace, uh, then Ukraine needs to be brought in as soon as possible, and perhaps the other uh, former Soviet states of Georgia and Moldova as well, so that uh, we draw a fresh and clear line to Vladimir Putin that uh, we will not tolerate attacks on these countries ever again. Okay, uh, any, of the, any of the panelists are Kurt, uh, and Nadia, my colleague in Washington, uh, how about some more questions from the chat line? You see some others, Kurt or Nadia, uh, Nicola or Nick or Steve? Uh, Morgan, we have a question from Lev Bulubets, a partner um, uh, at PWC. Uh, Ambassador, thank you for all your support. Uh, this is thank you from Americans and Ukrainians. If we can let ourselves think ahead to when it's time to rebuild, do you believe that the world will stick, will stick with Ukraine? Have we reached a tipping point or will the inertia re revert to business as usual? Uh, which since um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt has got us precisely to where we are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the Yes, I, I appreciate the question. Um, I believe that we have crossed the threshold here, that, that the world has crossed the threshold in its understanding of Russia and Putin, its understanding of the unprovoked aggression against Ukraine and sympathy for the Ukrainian people and what they've gone through. I think we, we have really truly crossed the threshold, which means that I think the effort to help Ukraine rebuild after the war uh, will be massive and sustained. I think it'll be different than it was before the war. Uh, and I think it's, it's not going to dissipate quickly. Uh, obviously with the passage of time, but we're talking 30, 40, 50 years, things hopefully will become normal. Uh, but I think in the immediate aftermath of the war, there will be both an urgency and a, and a massive scale to the support for Ukraine. Back to my question about the EU. Do you see an urgency there? We don't see one at the White House. How about yeah. the EU now? No, I don't. Uh, I think the EU is a lot like the US. Uh, it is slow, it's bureaucratic. It is making some of the right decisions now, as you said, financing Ukraine's purchase of arms. But the speed in which the EU moves is uh, just like the US, unfortunately. It is not uh, acting with enough alacrity. Individual member states, as we've talked about, and Germany in particular, um, also Poland, Estonia, Sweden, they are able to move more quickly and are doing so. What, what, what was responsible for the, the shocking or dramatic turnaround in Germany? It's a great question. Um, and I'm sure it had a lot to do with the visual images of uh, tax on civilians uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, I think that the, the public in Germany has been increasingly uh, anti-Putin, anti-Russian, 
uh, over the past few years. Uh, the government has been holding back on putting in place policies to reflect that. They've tried to just keep the, stip sh the ship steady, keep up the business ties, keep the energy flows, keep Nord Stream, et cetera. And I think it the dam finally broke with the images of the attacks on civilians in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, I, and I, I would put it this way, this, this weekend marks the time when Putin's employee, Gerhard Schroeder, finally lost his grip on German foreign policy. Okay, thank you very much. The reason I brought up the emphasis by Ukraine on NATO, is like throwing red meat in front of Putin. And again, it was never gonna happen, even if Putin had not been invaded because of, because of, the, of the NATO not wanting to take on Putin, just like everybody else. So it's always been, uh, you know, we know that George Bush, when he was president, made a big push in the midnight uh, 15 years ago to get Ukraine and NATO, and they got turned down by NATO. Yeah. So I think NATO's got a huge... Uh, There's uh, a responsibility. Responsibility yeah. here. And uh, the United States is a major part of NATO, though. Like We tried at least once, seriously, to make this happen, and it didn't happen. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of blame to go around. Yeah. Um, uh, Mikro has something. Yeah, yeah Ambassador, um, uh, talking to, about China, um, do you think the United States is actually engaging in some active dialogue with China to um, somehow, somehow counter Russia. I, and I realize everyone is talking about the Taiwan problem, uh, et cetera, but uh, um, obviously there are other solutions apart from Taiwan in this case. Yeah. Um, my own judgment, and, and maybe uh, others in this call here have ties or views on this as well, but my own judgment is China is not comfortable with what Russia is doing. They see themselves differently from this sort of behavior. They obviously want to take Taiwan, uh, but they view that as part of China, not an independent state. They're not comfortable with Russia attacking a sovereign state and, and, and engaging in such brutal uh, fighting as well, too. Uh, so I think China, while their long-term goals will be unchanged, I think they are going to try to put some distance between themselves and this Russian operation when it comes to anything they'd be doing in Asia. Another sense of urgency is the Atlantic Council and a lot of others are saying Putin just wasn't one Ukraine. He wants to destroy Europe and the United States. He wants to control the world. That's why he flew to China during the Olympics, because he wants to team up with China so that China and Russia as dictators and totalitarian states rule the world. What's your response to that, even if it's uh, halfway true? Yeah, well, I don't think that it's, it's a two-way street there. I think that Russia wants the relationship with China and wants to leverage that. Uh, I think the Chinese are a little bit less committed to this. They, they don't want to be against Russia. They really are not for what Russia is doing. And they're so much bigger and stronger and a rising power as compared to Russia. They feel time's on their side. Steve, you um, worked closely with the Congress for a long time. And with outstanding uh, senator from Arizona, uh, what's what's your advice and counsel from everybody here? How to put more pressure on the U.S. Congress and maybe the White House? Uh, they could act. We all know the White House and the U.S. military could act so quickly if they want to. They've got troops in Europe. They got supply bases all over the world. Looks like the key here is to get uh, is to get the White House. Can with a hold? sense of urgency here, it in today. and we don't quite understand why one of the world's uh, most evil people can't get the attention of the White House. Uh, okay, uh, well, Kurt, was, well, was Morgan, Steve is, yeah, I, I see Jim Slattery has an interesting question here, and I want to bring it okay. up. Okay, go ahead. Uh, which is, um, is there a way to communicate directly with the Russian forces to encourage them to defect? And I think that is a very important idea. Um, it is morally clear. And to, to go back to something I said in the beginning, I think a lot of the Russian forces are confused. They don't know where they are. They think they're in a training exercise. Uh, the Ukrainians have allowed a few of them to be interviewed and, and 
broadcast their message that they didn't realize that they were actually in Ukraine and that they were fighting Ukrainians. And when they realized this, they, they felt terrible about it. And I think um, the Ukrainian military itself um, is, and perhaps um, other ways we could get information to the Russian military to explain to them, this is what they are doing. Um, it, it would, there was one instance that I heard of this morning of a senior Russian officer shooting a more junior officer uh, because he refused to go fight in Ukraine. And so that is an indicator of the strain inside the military. And I think it is important for Ukrainians, whether it's through Russian language broadcasting or pamphlets or whatever it might be, um, they, to get information to the um, Russian military with a hope and with a request that they lay down their arms and defect or that they, they turn to the Ukrainian side. Uh, Steve, any comments from you about how to put pressure on the White House and the uh, Congress? I mean, it's just so difficult to get through. And uh, uh, this is key. The EU could move fat much faster and so could the United States. How are we gonna do that? Thank you, Morgan. And I apologize for being away. I, I was getting a phone call from, from one of my, my guys who's at the front line. And so I had to take it. Um, no, of course, of course, of course. I apologize. In terms of pressure, again, you know, Kurt's correct in saying that the, the, the tone on, on the Hill seems to be, I don't want to say it's tone deaf, but it's certainly not at the level where it needs to be uh, in the focus. Now, we have a lot of distractions right now, but as McCullough points out, we're at war. And, and I'll leave your audience with this, this story. Uh, during the fiercest fighting in Donbass in 2014, I met with the patriarch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, uh, Pila Rep. Mikola knows him well, I'm sure. And he said two things to me. First, kind of whimsical, he said, you know, Stepan, uh, the two things that the Ukrainian people need right now from the US are number one, rockets, and number two, prayers. And remember which I asked for first. And then he got serious and said, we, the Ukrainians, are fighting your war right now. We are fighting Vladimir Putin. If he's not stopped now, eventually you will be fighting Vladimir Putin. And that's exactly what is happening today. Because the threat goes beyond Ukraine, it goes to the heart of NATO, the countries that border Belarus, and this threat is imminent and it has to be dealt with. So I think if you can reach out to your contacts on the Hill and basically share with them this sense of urgency that Putin has to be stopped, he has to be stopped now. So we need more sanctions, we need more weapons, we need greater involvement, and God help us, we need a no-fly zone uh, to protect the Ukrainian people. So these are all important things. I would share them with your contacts. Let's push hard, let's help Ukraine. Let's motivate these senators and congressmen uh, to take action. It's just amazing when four former US ambassadors to Ukraine from different administrations went to Kiev about a week ago, of a month ago, their story was, your war is our war. Like you said, they're fighting the war for the free world. It's not just about Ukraine. Uh, that's so important to get across. And people have been trying to get that across to the Congress and the White House for a long time. Uh, uh, there's some more. I, th I think there's some more very interesting chat line questions. Now, Dia, Kurt, anybody can see those? Uh, Nadia, you got some more questions. There's a lot of them coming up there. Yeah, yes. I think the, the, there's one interesting point I'll just highlight for everyone, which is um, Ukrainian uh, tech specialists using cell phones, and, uh, social media, and even hacking uh, websites to get information into Russia. Uh, and I think that is important. Uh, I think that's a that's a very good thing. There are also some private hackers from Georgia that managed to do some pretty significant cyber attacks on, on Russian government uh, uh, websites, uh, playing Ukrainian music, showing Ukrainian pictures. Uh, so I think those are all, um, that, that tech war, I think, is also incredibly important. Ukrainians are good at that. 
Regarding the uh, State of the Union, uh, it's tonight and there'll be a response to it as well. Um, I'm sure what we will hear from President Biden is the, the moral clarity about the war, the fact that he has put in place a lot of sanctions and that we have increased our military support to Ukraine and that we have really rallied NATO together, that we are all on the same page, all of which is true. But I'll repeat what Steve just said and what I said earlier, what you said, Morgan, is it still doesn't come with the sense of urgency and delivery that is required here. And, and that I hope is part of what some of the senators um, will be saying after the State of the Union. Okay, uh, Nadia, any some more questions? Yes, we have a lot. Thank you everyone for engaging in chat line and uh, putting your questions. Um, there is a question uh, about the possibility of transferring of this war uh, into Balkans uh, and uh, Scandinavian states. Would you like to comment on that, Ambassador? Can you repeat that again? Uh, I'm just so reading what, the chat messages. Sure. Um, is there a possibility for this war to be transferred to other parts of European continent? You already said that yes, but especially Scandinavia and uh, Balkans. Right. Um, well, yes and no. Um, first off, uh, I think that Putin has his hands full trying to take Ukraine. And so his focus for the immediate period is to bring all his forces to bear to try to conquer Ukraine. And uh, I hope that uh, all of us give Ukraine enough support that he fails at this. If he does succeed at this, uh, he has broken every rule. He has broken every cloak of deniability. Uh, he has unmasked his ambition to reestablish a Russian empire and he will move on uh, not just to consolidate Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, but to take additional territories that he feels rightly belong to Russia. And these will include uh, Moldova, possibly Georgia, possibly the Baltic states. And uh, I don't believe that he will openly attack Finland and Sweden, but I think that the reaction to Putin, whether it is uh, in defeat or, or, or conquest, uh, will be uh, Finland and Sweden ultimately to join NATO. The uh, Finns are now a, a clear majority in favor of joining. The Swedes are not quite there, but they will get there soon. Um, so, so I think that you will see them join NATO. You will see pressure from within NATO to uh, bring in other countries uh, such as Georgia or Moldova if, um, uh, if we can do that. And then in the Balkans, uh, to divert onto that a little bit, um, Putin has uh, been working with Serbia on a sort of a, a miniature version of what Russia is doing. He is promoting Serbian nationalism as opposed to Russian nationalism. He is working through the church, the Serbian Orthodox Church. Uh, he is um, trying to use that relationship with Serbia as a means of, in, of extending Russian influence in the Balkans and keeping countries in the Balkans away from Europe and away from NATO. And so Serbia is his proxy for doing that. Uh, this uh, has been going on for years. It uh, will continue to go on and accelerate if he manages to consolidate control of Ukraine. Again, gloves off, unmasked, he's going for it. Uh, if he is stopped in Ukraine, I think it then raises for us the stakes of stopping him in the Balkans as well and pushing back on the use of Serbian nationalism to divide the countries in the Balkans. Nadia, yes, there's some more questions. Yes, uh, there is a question about Green Corridor. Uh, who should oversee the implementation of this Green Corridor? How that uh, should practically be implemented? What organization uh, should oversee it? Well, it's a great question. Um, I think, first off, it's going to take US leadership to construct the idea, work with Poland, work with Germany, work with Ukrainians, 
Um, I can see the point uh, someone in the chat mentioned, uh, don't let it be NATO, but maybe something that is more multilateral. I can't see the Russians, however, allowing OSCE or anything under a UN mandate to do anything. Uh, so I think we'd be looking at a coalition of countries uh, that would be establishing this. Uh, and I think the US would have to be one of the leaders in that. We, we could form uh, internationally, it's, it wouldn't be the first time that you, you create um, a Friends of Ukraine group. Uh, we did this for Afghanistan, uh, where it's countries that sign up on a voluntary basis to say, we want to be part of this grouping that will take part in this effort. Thank you. Ambassador, do you think uh, we will win this war? Do you think Ukraine yes. will stand? Yes, yes, I think so. Um, I wrote about this as well, and, and you can find it on SIPA. Uh, but Ukrainians know who they are. Uh, they know who they are not. They are Ukrainians. They are not Russians. They are people who believe in human rights and democracy and freedom. Uh, they don't believe in taking that away from people. They believe, and it's deeply ingrained in Ukrainians, they have a right to choose their own government, not to have one imposed on them whether it's internally or externally, uh, they will not accept that. Uh, they know they are European. They know they want to have a open economy, part of Europe, integrated into Europe. They know they want safety for their future generations. Um, so many generations of Ukrainians have suffered and uh, the current generation, the young generation of Ukrainians want to build a Ukraine that is strong, prosperous and safe, part of Europe and one where the future generations won't suffer the way the current one is or previous ones have. Those are all parts of what is just embedded into the fabric of the Ukrainian identity. And Putin can't change that. He can kill people, he can surround cities, he can blow things up, but he can't change what Ukrainians are. And ultimately that's why Ukraine will win and Putin will lose. Let's hope so. We believe so, but I hope that the uh, international community also believes so. There is a lot of resilience. A lot of people are actually switching from uh, a daily Russian to daily Ukrainian, which is quite hot. Uh, but um, patriotism is uh, tremendous. And all those atrocities that have happened in Kharkiv, which is 40 kilometers from uh, Russia, and it has always been viewed as a kind of pro-Russian city, it will never be pro-Russian anymore. This is this is terrible. So I think Ukraine is united as never before. And, and this is a turning point in history of Ukraine because I personally have been thinking that Ukraine has been torn between West and East for centuries. And, and that's why we failed quite often. We had chances before, exactly 100 years ago, we had a chance, but we lost it. Uh, this time, I guess this uh, horrible aggression uh, finally united Ukraine as one nation. Yes. Thank you very much, Makola. And we understand there's uh, been a very uh, strong uh, and rather calm mood in in the Kiev. Everybody's not panicking and you know running all kinds of places. Uh, what do you think about the the the, the mood there in, in Kiev? You, where you've been, where your law firm is? Well, the mood is definitely uh, very organized um, in both in Kyiv and outside of Kyiv. People are helping each other. There are blog posts a lot uh, and, and the territorial uh, force, fighting forces are making sure that the, the terrorists are, are not here. Uh, people are helping, people are raising tons of money to, uh, to help each other. Uh, and um, I mean, there are people struggling with food supplies with not many pharmacies are open. So medicine is uh, not readily available. And obviously this is definitely not the pre-war uh, lifestyle that we have, but nonetheless, people are very optimistic. Despite that, we are talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian who are uh, fleeing uh, to the West and uh, actually crossing the border. The majority of Ukrainians are staying put. The majority of people in Kyiv are staying. Uh, as I mentioned, most of our, um, or at least half of our uh, employees are staying in Kyiv. Many of them joined uh, the territorial um, fighting forces. And um, I think the, um, the spirit actually is, is going up. Uh, we have seen a few days that uh, we have not seen a lot of um, success in movements, but at the same time, Kyiv uh, remains 
um, strong and uh, uh, not uh, occupied by, by the Russian forces. Uh, and uh, the, the support that we are getting now, and the messages at least of support that we are getting from the EU are extremely encouraging. And uh, I really hope that what Ambassador Walker was saying, that that sense of urgency will, will finally prevail and all of those weapons are finally shipped to Ukraine and apparently they are already shipped uh, or being shipped rather. Uh, that will uh, strengthen uh, people here in Kiev as, as well as in, as in Odessa and, and Kherson and Sumy and Kharkiv as well. And of course, people, uh, what, I, what I hear from my partners who are in the West of Ukraine, uh, there, is a, there are tons of forces in Western Ukraine who are not engaged in the, in the conflict yet because they have their own territory to defend. But uh, as most of you know, Western Ukrainians are super patriotic and uh, they are really uh, eager to fight. So uh, I uh, really hope that Belarus uh, will not engage into, into this conflict, otherwise, there will be huge attack from Western Ukraine into Belarus directly. So um, I hope that in the, I hope it won't take us 10 days as uh, Ambassador Volker said, I hope it will take us five days to finish this because um, people are too nervous. I, I feel it myself. Uh, a few days uh, are okay and then you get nervous, really nervous again, so. Well, Kurt, thank you very much for very, uh, very well describing the Ukraine spirit the Ukraine's sense of uh, patriotism and freedom and wanting to be a part of the West. But we've all, Kurt, uh, Nick, Steve, and I, and you, and everybody else has found this uh, in most of the Ukrainian population. And again, we wish the Ukrainian elite had had more of this through the years. And once again, the people of Ukraine suffer. After World War I, uh, through the Orange Revolution, the revolution of dignity, the people of Ukraine have spoken very clearly and loudly where they stand. Uh, Nadia, some more questions? There's a lot of them up there. There's a question from Nikola. There's a question from Nikola, which is how the Ukrainian economy is holding up right now. Uh, is there access to food? Is there access to cash? Yeah, well, I was just typing that. Uh, uh, surprisingly, Ukrainian banking system is working very well, uh, and Ukrainian National Bank and the banks are actually calling people to use bank cards, to use electronic uh, payments uh, instead of cash, because uh, ATMs, uh, you, uh, it's hard to find an ATM that has uh, enough cash, uh, you, you have to run around the city, but um, in the stores you can pay with cards, so I mean, we are living in, in definitely in the 21st century and it's working, so as long as the Ukrainian electricity infrastructure stays uh, working, everything will be fine because then we'll have the uh, connection and we'll have the uh, the banking system working. In terms of food, uh, I've been to supermarkets several times myself. Um, uh, there are not, not a lot of food there, but supermarkets are promising that they will be delivering more and more. Uh, surprisingly, uh, it's really hard to find bread uh, while all of the expensive uh, uh, imported uh, foods are still are, uh, available. Um, but people are managing and uh, the Ukrainian ministries are offering help to those who are definitely in need. So, so far it's, it's more or less okay. It's, it's not ideal, obviously, but, uh, but people are not starving. Yeah. Um, your point about electricity there, again, you know, just reinforces the importance of sustaining the electricity grid and connecting it to Europe. And Yanez uh, in the chat indicated that European ministers uh, met on this in an emergency session and thought that this could be accomplished within two weeks. Well, Kurt, we think that uh, we were very kind of surprised with about two, two and a half weeks ago, some major US corporations were lobbying the White House to be careful about sanctions because they were worried about their supply chains. Uh, out of Russia. We think uh, that's, we get some indication that's changed. Yes. That what's going on over there is much more important than supply chains. We know supply chains are important, but in the long run, defeating Putin, as you say, has got to be the number one priority, number five and number 10, not, not keeping up your supply chains and continuing to uh, pour money into uh, <laughs> into Russia. Another yeah. question, Nadia? Um, there is a comment from uh, Ken Peoples. 
I would hope that Ambassador Walker is appointed to lead the U.S. effort uh, for the post-conflict resolution. Just a compliment from our audience to you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, look, <laughs> someone will have to do this, and I would be honored. But you know, it's, it's not about me or anyone. It's about getting Ukraine through this. Morgan, uh, Alex Gordon uh, raised his hand. Um, can we uh, get another question from Alex? Sure, sure. Yes, hello everybody, Ambassador. Thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned that in order for Ukraine to be considered as a NATO member, the hostilities have to end and it's understood. However, doesn't this give uh, Putin the incentive to keep Ukraine involved in the conflict on an ongoing basis in order to prevent just that? Yeah, yeah, it, I understand your point. It's very much like what happened with the occupied territories. You occupy the territory and you keep them out. But just to be completely realistic, um, to bring Ukraine into NATO while Russia is still in a position of fighting Ukraine brings NATO directly into the conflict, which is something that our leaders uh, in the US and, and other NATO countries simply won't do right now. Uh, so I, I appreciate your, your point, but I just don't see it until the war is over. It's understood. It's just uh, and there, you don't see any other way to deal with this issue and kind of uh, provide uh, not now. An incentive. Not now. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Alex Gordon is a great uh, patriot of Ukraine, and he's in New York, and he's been trying to put together for years financial packages for uh, for Ukraine. Just been a great uh, friend, and and it's difficult to put financial packages together as you know, uh, but he's wow. put some together and it's been a great effort on his part. I think there's some, quite a few more questions, uh, Nadia. Yeah, there, there are a lot. <laughs> Let me see. We, we also have um, several raised hands. Uh, Roman Andrejcik from uh, Philadelphia. Can we take a question from him, from the audience? Oh, sure. Roman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my question is the Budapest Memorandum should justify the US and other signatories to defend Ukraine. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I think from if, if you're looking for legal justification, yes, um, it's not a legally binding document, but it is uh, politically significant. Uh, Russia, of course, violating it and it gives a reason to the UK, US and France to uh, to support it and to support Ukraine. The the lack of justification is not what's holding the US or, or European countries back. Uh, it's the other issues that we talked about, the the um, the fear of provoking even harsher attacks from Russia, the possibility of uh, getting into a direct conflict with Russia that would lead to a nuclear exchange. Uh, those are the things holding people back, not the justification. Okay, Nadia, let's continue. We have a few more minutes before Kurt has to go to his next webinar. <laughs> He's in high demand. Uh, Nadia? Marta, Marta Parema has a question. Marta, uh, you can speak. Unmute yourself, Marta. We're hearing Roman's uh, family and we're not hearing Marta. Yeah. Uh, Roman, can you mute yourself, please? Marta, uh, if you have a question, go ahead. Okay, okay Gary. Uh, Marta. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we have a question from uh, Gary Roche. Gary, would you like to put a question? Yes, I'd love to listen. I'm in Ukraine, I'm American uh, with a Ukrainian family and lots of people here on the farm where I live about 140 kilometers south of Kiev. And a lot of people are coming here because they're, they're trying to get away uh, from the, the problems and they're here, they're safe, of course. But the thing that really bugs me, and I think um, 
Well, uh, uh, Stephen Nix, you mentioned it. You know, this no-fly zone, I think, is the biggest issue that most of us think is necessary at this point in time. And we are, you said something like 60 uh, airplanes you, that, that, that would be available. We're hearing that other countries are willing to give airplanes, even don't even have to base them in Ukraine. They can be based outside of Ukraine. And if it's not a Ukrainian pilot, you can give the guy a Ukrainian passport and we can call him Ukrainian. But we need those planes and we need them like tomorrow, quite frankly, that's what I believe. And so how can we do that? How can we get that moving? Thank you. Well, thank you. That's an excellent question. But there's a there's a distinction between uh, the use of this these aircraft that are being provided from EU countries, and that is to provide air cover and close air support for Ukrainian troops. And most importantly, uh, you've all read about the huge Russian convoy that is approaching Kiev. Uh, right now, uh, Ukraine's unable to strike at that column. Under normal circumstances. You go after that column and strafe it and destroy it. But the Russians are protecting this 30 to 40 kilometer long column with their own aircraft. So that's what Ukraine needs immediately is to engage and try to take out these Russian formations that are on the ground. Uh, so that's, that's one mission. Uh, a no-fly zone is a completely different mission, which is the ambassador said to protect uh, the civilian population uh, over Kiev, uh, perhaps even over Kharkiv, but, but major cities. Uh, altogether a different mission. So it looks like the first mission is going to come into force. We understand that some of these planes will be based in Poland and will cross uh, Ukrainian airspace and be deployed to help the Ukrainian armed forces. The no-fly zone, as the ambassador said, is much more complex, badly needed. Uh, but it's going to take the agreement of, of uh, uh, NATO countries to, to engage and the, the real, I suppose, challenging point here is, as been said previously, uh, the fear of direct engagement with Russian aircraft, which could lead to escalating uh, hostilities and, again, even triggering nuclear war. Okay, uh, uh, one final question. Well, we go, Kurt's going to have to leave before very long. You know, one more quick question, not in, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, we have a question from George uh, Barras. Why can't we borrow the Israeli Iron Dome to protect cities? I think there's a couple of points here. Um, one of them is the uh, Israelis use theirs. And so they, they don't want it to do to the protection of their own cities, uh, which are frequently subject to rocket attacks. Uh, secondly, Israel is keeping its head down right now. They have a lot of interests with Russia and they're keeping their head down a bit to the frustration of many in the Israeli population. Um, and finally, uh, it, we're talking about U.S. equipment as well, too. And there's no reason why the U.S. cannot be uh, adding far greater and far faster air defense assistance to Ukraine. We should be doing it immediately. Okay, well, we'll wrap up here. One of the comments made by the three ambassadors was the United States could do more through cyber, uh, through cyber attacks from our military. They just said it's unbelievable what our military could do to, uh, to strike against the Ukraine, Russian military if they just would. So again, the two concepts from today, a sense of urgency for the EU, the Congress and the White House, and let's increase humanitarian support. There's at least 100, 150 organizations in the United States and in Ukraine that are doing a good job. There's lots of information about that. We'll be sending out more. Anybody wants to donate can find that. So Kurt, again, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we all got to work on this sense of urgency and humanitarian assistance. Kurt, uh, your final comments. And again, thank you very much. Yeah, thank and you so thank, much. Thank, thank you to Steve and Macola. Yeah, Th thanks everybody. Thank you, Morgan, for organizing this and Steve and Macola. Um, um, it's good to be with you on this. And one point that I want to stress uh, in closing here, and it, it was reflected a little bit in a comment in the chat. No one here, uh, not me, not Morgan, not anyone, is looking at this through partisan glasses, that this is a Republican or a Democrat concern or effort. 
criticism uh, is about policy and about actions, no matter who's doing it. And so it's fair sometimes to criticize. Uh, and I think in this case, what we want, and Jim Slatterty mentioned this in a comment as well, we want bipartisan strength. We want bipartisan support for the most robust and fastest and um, you know, energized and urgent US assistance to Ukraine. And it's not a partisan thing at all. It's what we need to do as a country and it's what we need to do for Ukraine as a country. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Stephen, any final comment? I just wanna say thank you all for attending this important event for giving your time and attention to Ukraine. And to Makola, I'll just say, Slava Ukraino. Thank Mikola. you. Oh, I am Slava. Your final comment, Makola. Thank you, Morgan, for inviting. Thank you for everyone for your support. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Walker, for, uh, for your tremendous support and for pushing this agenda with the White House and with the Hill. I really hope that uh, we'll, the, the war will end soon, but I'm sure we will win. Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraine. Okay. No, I am Slava. Okay. Thank you to everybody. We hope to have another webinar soon. So uh, take care. Continue to fight. Get the message across to the Congress and the White House and the European Union. Full speed ahead. Fight, 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 fight. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you. Take thank care. You,